Ete iwi, kaurai ka mai, kote fariwananga o tamaki makoro atu nai tana koto tana koto tana tato katoa. Kia ora and a huge no mai hari mai. A big welcome to the initial, the premiere edition of the uh, University of Auckland Shaping the Future webinar series. Uh, in this webinar, we'll be talking about how we can shape the future through educational education, law, and public policy. Now, um, just before we do get started, um, there is a Q&A function, so feel free to pop any questions that you have whatsoever um, on the uh, Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screen there, uh, and we will have a section at the end of that um, to go through those. Um, now, if we don't reach everything, we will uh, have a copy of those questions and we'll get back to you within the next week or so. Um, now we also will be having a little bit more of audience engagement and we'll be having a, um, a little poll that goes up uh, shortly. Uh, one of my colleagues will pop that up in the next couple of minutes, um, which will just assess kind of where you're tuning in from and uh, what, what your current background is. And if you work within any of these areas, I can see that the polls have popped up there. Um, so feel free to choose, uh, choose one of those, which is applicable to you. And then also another polling question, which is, um, based on your current knowledge around the UN's uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which will be a key focus of today's, uh, today's webinar. Now, before I uh, introduce our expert panelists that we have uh, this afternoon or this morning or this evening, depending on where you're tuning in from, I'm just gonna give a brief overview of the University of Auckland. So uh, you may or may not know, but New Zealand has eight universities um, in the country and the University of Auckland is New Zealand's largest of those eight university with eight of those eight universities with 42,000 students and over 5,000 staff. And we're um, specific to this webinar, it's important to note that we are ranked number one uh, in the country for um, the Times Higher Education and QS rankings from both 2019 and 2020. Uh, and that leaves us at the 81st globally uh, in terms of the QS uh, world rankings of universities. Now, like um, Auckland as a city, uh, we also have a very, very diverse student and staff base. So we have over 8,000 international students studying with us at the University of Auckland from 120 um, different, different countries there. So you can be sure, very similar to the city of Auckland, which is one of the most uh, diverse uh, cities uh, in the world are culturally diverse. Um, the University of Auckland also mirrors that uh, within our student and staffing base. We're also the highest ranked New Zealand university for graduate employability. Now this goes hand in hand with New Zealand's uh, position of being able, being best placed to um, provide students with um, what they need for jobs of the future. So educating uh, for future. There's a statistic that I heard recently that there's around about 60% of, of uh, children that are in schools uh, at the moment are gonna end up in jobs that don't currently exist yet, which is equally as exciting as it is scary, uh, but an education at the University of Auckland will be able to prepare you, um, prepare you for, um, prepare for employment post-graduation. Now, I will just go over the uh, eight faculties of the University of Auckland. Um, so we have eight faculties in the University of Auckland and over 200 programs from all the way through from foundation options to undergraduate bachelor degrees to graduate diplomas, postgraduate certificates, postgraduate diplomas, masters and the doctoral level. So the full, the full range there. Now, those programs are split over eight different faculties at the University of Auckland. So uh, we have the Faculty of Arts, uh, of which we do have a representative um, of the Faculty of Arts with us uh, today, who I'll introduce in just a moment. We have uh, the Faculty of Business and Business and Economics. Again, with a few different specializations that you can um, work towards there in accounting, finance, management and international business. Um, we have the Faculty of Creative Arts and Industries, which is one of the faculties that I look after, specializing within architecture, urban planning, fine arts, music, dance, design, uh, and also the Faculty of Education and Social Work. Again, we do have a representative with us today on the panel who will be able to talk a little bit more about that and the stuff that we're doing within educational leadership. 
the Faculty of Engineering, uh, you may be um, noting a theme here that there is lots of different specializations within each of the faculties and, and engineering is no exception. We have the, uh, if students want to specialize within civil, structural, mechanical, uh, software, even robotics and aerospace, uh, we have options for those students. We also have the Faculty of Law. Uh, again, we're, we're joined with the representative uh, today from the Faculty of Law. Um, the Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences, which as the name suggests, um, specializes within medicine, uh, public health, health promotion, pharmacy, nursing, and the like. And then we also have uh, one of our large faculties at the University of Auckland is our Faculty of Science. And very similarly to the Faculty of Arts, um, the science is kind of an umbrella term and there's lots and lots of different specializations uh, that students can uh, choose to studying all the way from chemistry to computer science, to uh, information technology management, to psychology, uh, really, there's the the full um, the, the full lot there. Now, if you um, we will be sending these slides through um, as we after we finish, um, probably uh, tomorrow or, or early next week. Uh, and so you can see at the bottom of this page um, that there is, if you do want to get some further information about uh, any of the faculties or any of the course offerings. Um, at the University of Auckland. I encourage you to go on that website. It's a very comprehensive website uh, and you'll be able to find out some more information there. What's important to note um, here as well is that today we've got representatives from the Faculty of Arts, the Faculty of Education and Social Work and the Faculty of Law. Uh, next week we'll have the uh, international webinar, webinar um, on shaping the future through medical and health sciences and um, the Faculty of Science and then the following week after that on the 29th of October I believe um, we'll have another webinar which focuses on business innovation, creative arts and industries and design and engineering as well. So be sure to register, if not already, um, for those to get a little bit more information about that. Now, moving to this uh, next slide here. Um, the University of Auckland is also a very internationally connected university. So we have over 180 partners in 45 different countries. Uh, the university is a member of three consortia of research-led universities, so Universitas 21, the Association of Pacific Rim Universities, uh, and the World Universities uh, Network. Now, what this means is that it supports our cooperation and exchange agreements with over 150 different universities uh, in the world. So students um, in a in a regular year would be able to then take um, exchange opportunities and study abroad opportunities uh, with some of our partners there. It also means that we have a very extensive and global alumni network and a strong platform for international research and collaboration um, and overseas opportunities there. Now moving through to the next slide, um, we do just want to touch upon, and this is was in the poll as well, uh, is the sustainable development goals um, set by the UN. Now the University of Auckland is very, very proud to be the number one university in the world for sustainable impact um, as rated by the Times Higher Education University Impact Rankings. Now there's 17 uh, sustainable development goals, often referred to as SDGs, um, and we'll be touching upon a few of these uh, on today's webinar. Uh, what this does is um, it recognizes our commitment to sustainability and making a positive social impact through research, teaching and knowledge transfer. So we'll talk a little bit more in detail about those uh, within the next hour. Okay, so now uh, the reason that you're all here today is obviously to hear our um, expert panel uh, on, on their uh, insights there. So today I'm joined by Dr. Anna Hood from the Faculty of Law. Um, Anna is an Associate Dean International and Senior Lecturer at the University of Auckland and has a, um, a specialization within international and disarmament law. We have Dr. John Morgan from the Faculty of Education and Social Work. He's the head of school for critical studies in education and has a specific focus on human geography. And then we also have Dr. Tim Fadgen from the Faculty of Arts as well, and also a member of the Public Policy Institute, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about um, in, the, uh, in the next hour, and is Associate Director Postgraduate Programs at the Faculty of Arts. Uh, to the right, I should introduce myself, that's a little on me. Um, I am the International Manager for the Faculty of Education and Social Work uh, and Creative Arts and Industries here at the University of Auckland, but my role today is to be the moderator, the host, the spirit guide throughout the, uh, this uh, panel discussion.
Now, last but not least, we also do have a very special guest with us today. We have an alumni guest speaker, uh, Mr. Min Trong, um, who is a Master of Public Policy alumni, so the same program that Dr. Tim Fadgen uh, teaches on, and is a New Zealand ASEAN Scholar recipient, and is currently working within the Consulate General of Canada in Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon, Vietnam. Um, so it'll be great to hear both the academic and the student uh, insights uh, in, the next, um, in the next hour. Okay, so without further ado, um, if I could ask my academics to make sure that they've got their mics uh, turned on. Um, so we often, we often think of sustainability in terms of environmental sustainability and climate change, but there are many other dimensions to sustainability. What is sustainability? What does sustainability mean to you? Uh, and why do you think it's important to question the traditional thinking about sustainability? If I could get um, Tim, Dr. Tim Fadgen from the Faculty of Arts to, to lead this question, and then I'll pass over to John. Uh, kia ora. Thanks, Ben. Um, well, I, I think with this question, just to kind of get the ball rolling, uh, we tend to think of sustainability as um, something related to the environment. Um, but um, throughout most scholarship and uh, academics tend to look at it as involving also the elements of society and the economy. And the principle asks us to consider how we can ensure uh, that the things we enjoy today are there for those who come after us and how we might extend those benefits to others. And so it's an important part of that question that we be in a position to evaluate and reevaluate the notion of sustainability um, because the categories themselves are variable. Uh, citizens must determine the proper balance of them. Striking the balance should be based on the best evidence that we have, uh, and, and, uh, and decisions have to arise from the citizenry, a fully engaged and informed citizenry, um, to help us make more and better policy decisions. Thank you so much for your insights there, uh, Tim. John, would you be able to weigh in um, on that as well? So what does sustainability mean to you and why do you think it's important to question those traditional thinkings around uh, sustainability? Well, I think I, I'd sort of, thank you, uh, thank you, Ben and Kia ora. Um, I think I, I'd sort of go along with what, what Tim has just spoken about, uh, the, the, the sort of have a, a wider definition of what sustainability entails. I think for me as an educator, um, I, I think the word is, is often means everything to everybody. It's one of those portmanteau terms that can sort of satisfy everybody um, who can be against sustainability. And I think for me as an educator, one of the key challenges is to try to dis distinguish and discern different meanings of the term. So just to give two examples, one, one would be um, uh, when we often talk about sustainability, we talk in terms of technical solutions, either technologies or management systems in order to make uh, a more sustainable world. And I think they, they tend to be very human centered. The other, other angle from that would take a more ecocentric approach, which starts with the earth first. Um, they lead to very different conceptions of what type of society and what type of economy and what type of ecological base we'd be using. So I think sort of, uh, I'd sort of add to Tim to say, we just need to sort of discern different meanings of the term and try to unpick those. Fantastic, thank you so much, John there. And, and turning over to uh, Anna, um, from the Faculty of Law, um, considering your discipline and your, and your background within um, law, specifically international law, um, what do you think are some of the most important global challenges that we're going to need to address in the next five to 25 years? Thanks so much, Ben, and Kira Koto. Um, it's lovely to be joining you this afternoon. Um, so there are so many big um, global challenges that um, those of us in the law faculty are thinking about and working on. In the area of international law, um, obviously climate change and environmental issues um, are a huge um, issue that we're um, working on and um, trying to get action around. There are also big issues around global migration. We currently have over 70 million people people worldwide who have been forcibly displaced from their homes and so international lawyers spend a lot of time thinking about how do we provide protection to those people and pathways to um, places where they'll be able to be safe and to re-establish their lives. Um, there are lots of different other areas um, from human rights to poverty to trade but I think one other sort of key issue in the international system at the moment that really underpins all of the different big substantive areas is the extent to which the general international system is working well. Um, we've seen in the last five years or so quite a lot of different countries 
walking away from international organizations, whether that's the World Health Organization or the World Trade Organization. Countries are more hesitant about signing up to international treaties. And so we've got a bit of a legitimacy crisis in the system at the moment. And there are some good reasons for that. There have traditionally been quite a lot of problems in the system, but it's also concerning. And I think in the next five to 25 years, we're really gonna to have to work hard on designing a system and reconceptualizing a system that works well for everyone and ensures that we can really tackle the many different issues that exist. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Anna, there for your insights. Um, Tim, would you be able to also tackle that question? So maybe from the public policy standpoint, what you think are some of the most uh, important global challenges that we're going to need to address in the near future? Uh, thanks, Ben. Yeah, I, I'm a, I think Anna identified uh, many really important uh, issues. Um, just to sort of recap a couple, um, climate change, obviously, something we've already kind of alluded to, income e inequality and economic growth, uh, but also uh, to uh, another of her themes, government accountability, democratic issues, including citizen participation. So um, recently, the OECD had put out a report um, that's projected massive uh, shifts in economic activity to emerging economies, including many countries throughout Asia. Uh, and with the global share of GDP in these countries um, being projected to outpace those of the, of the OECD by 2060. So if we think about these uh, themes in the context of sustainability, we have to think about what challenges are likely to emerge on the, uh, from a public policy perspective and in citizen engagement. And what skills do we need um, uh, as practitioners, as researchers, as, as students and, and others to address them? Um, we, we certainly will need to, 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 again, to echo some of Anna's uh, comments, a strong global network of like-minded professionals. Um, these are often forged uh, at the university um, uh, during studies. Um, and in the interaction between researchers, students, and the practitioner communities. Um, and we need to consider how economic growth is being done and it, whether it's being done sustainably, um, keeping in mind the balance of, of the environment and the societal aspect that we mentioned earlier. Um, and if we don't, we end up with situations in which there's a high degree of social dislocation, sustained in, uh, economic inequality, damage to the environment and all of the social impacts that these have. Again, uh, Anne has alluded to this as being in the context now and many uh, projections have that being an ongoing issue that are gonna require our constant attention and engagement in the years to come. Fantastic, thanks, thanks Tim. Um, John, would you also be able to, to make any additions on that? Um, perhaps from, from your background in either educational leadership or uh, human geography? Well, I think in terms of um... In terms of the list of issues which are, are sort of have been mentioned by Anna and Tim, um, I, I, won't, I won't go over those again. But I think in terms of education, there, there's a question which I think is, is is broadly has to be framed in this way: is that for most of the last 70 years, education has been undertaken with the assumption that the world is going to be on an upward curve, is going to be increased in terms of levels of globalization, and that the sort of prospects for a better world and a better life for future generations. Um, is sort of taken as red. I think we are facing, and the last six months have become very sort of apparent to this, the possibility that environmental climate change, um, pandemics, economic shifts may mean that we live in a much more precarious society. So the question I'm interested in is for, for me as an education is how can we as a society and how can we as, as, as a world in a sense learn to, to live on the planet we're at? And I think that's the broadest frame is and it's not just to do with education it's to do with all disciplines represented here today and in the next couple of weeks too so that that's the broad question societal learning and how do we how do we make the world sustainable to live on well, that's, that's a, it's a great question, uh, John, and we've obviously heard um, a little bit about the, the different issues that uh, are going to be important to address. But, but sticking with you, uh, John, uh, what role do you think universities should or can play uh, within addressing these challenges? How can we help? Well, I think my, my sense here is, is and this is, I speak for myself, um, education, uh, universities tend to, to be all things to all people. They, they, in many ways, they satisfy individual needs for uh, meritocracy and for advancement and achievement and for economic um, well-being. Um, yet at the same time, they also 
try to aim the type for the types of social and citizenship goals that Tim alluded to in an earlier answer in a way. Now one of the questions is how far are those are compatible and which of those head um, which of those lead in a way. So I think universities at the moment are part of a sort of a reset around trying to decide what are the societal values, what are the goals and what are the aims of where we're trying to head in the next 15 to 20 years and what types of skill sets, what types of dispositions, what types of competencies and dare say it, what types of knowledge are required to make that a reality. Um, so I think universities were going to play a central role in, in, the, in the reset which is taking place post COVID. Yeah, I'm sure that um, all our panelists would agree uh, with you with you there, uh, John. Uh, Tim, would you be able to to build on that on um, maybe from your your perspective, what role universities can uh, have in addressing the challenges that we've identified? Yeah, um, thanks, Ben. Um, I think uh, John put it really well. I, I hadn't thought of it that way before, but uh, this reset, it's a really uh, nice way to put it because um, tied into this conversation today are questions about values uh, in society um, and the how society arrives at the sort of allocation of resources and deciding and determining the sort of society we want to live in. Um, it depends on having a strong evidence base and people who are given uh, or sort of develop the necessary analytical skills in order to make those decisions. So universities play a central role in that um, and how we address these challenges. So we need to focus on and do educating and training students to be leaders in their uh, respective fields, communities, internationally. Um, we uh, are working to equip students here uh, well, I shouldn't say equip them with curious minds, they come in with those, but hopefully through our courses, they develop those things a bit more. Uh, and we equip you with analytical tools to confidently make smart, informed decisions so that you can anticipate challenges and um, also um, work through solutions to them working uh, through that. So that's part of the teaching model we have here at the university, uh, which I'm happy to be a part of, is this research-based model. So we're active researchers who bring in our own research into the classroom to try to stimulate these sorts of discussions and approaches to problem solving. Great. Thanks for your insights there. Um, Anna? Thanks so much. Um, so fantastic answers from John and Tim to build a little bit more on them. Um, in terms of the classroom, in addition to the wonderful things Tim's just been talking about, in the law school, we're really committed to um, providing all students from all different backgrounds access to understanding about the law and how it works and how it can contribute to solving some of the big issues we face as a society. So some of our degrees train you um, to be lawyers, some of our post degrees, we already have people who are already lawyers coming in, but we also have some post programs such as our um, Master of Legal Studies, where people who have been out in, the, in other professions can come in and get a taste of the law and a bit of an understanding. And so we're very focused on ensuring that a whole range of people can get access to information and new ways of thinking about some of the big problems. We also um, put a lot of emphasis on giving our students, in addition to having them question and uh, develop analytical minds, giving them exposure in the field. So we build in opportunities for internships, um, exchanges that have already been mentioned, and a chance to really participate in some of the big issues going on. And I think that one of the strengths of Auckland Law School is that we have um, a number of our academics, quite a lot of academics actually, in addition to their academic research and teaching, are also involved in um, work in the real world and so a lot of our faculty members are involved in big negotiations um, on international issues, advising governments, helping civil society actors, um, so it's a really vibrant place to be um, and quite an exciting place to be right now as we're thinking about how we go forward in the next couple of decades. Fantastic, thanks, thanks Anna and thanks Tim and John um for uh, your answers there now now sticking with you uh, anna for this next uh, question so uh, anna you work in international law uh, can you tell us a little bit more about your work in this area and what role international law can play in helping the global community um shape a more sustainable future sure so international law when it comes down to it i think is really this is two key things that it's trying to do. On the one hand, it's a mechanism for um, different countries and groups um, to come together to try and work out 
how we deal with big global problems like climate change and migration and refugee issues. Um, and another the second part of it is that we want to come up with mechanisms where we can resolve big international disputes peacefully so that we don't end up um, with countries going to war against each other. So those are sort of the two key things that international law is trying to do solve problems and come up with solutions and stop us having major disputes. And I think historically, um, and even today in some ways, international law at times hasn't always been as helpful as we might like to think it is. So um, there's a long history of international law at times actually being part of the problem and creating some of the issues that we see around the world today. So to give you just one quick example, with the 70 million people who are displaced, part of the problem and part of the reason we've got that issue is that our international system just doesn't provide sufficient pathways for protection for people who may have been displaced because of climate change or disasters or famine. Um, so when working in international law, it's a, really, it's a really interesting space to be in at the moment because um, there's a lot of promise in international law and what we can do and there's a hope of trying to solve things, but we've also got to tackle some of the inbuilt issues that exist within the legal system already. So um, it's, it's a fascinating area to engage with. Thanks, Anna. And you've touched on uh, this next uh, question uh, a little bit in your answer that you just provided then. Um, but uh, tying it into the sustainable development goals that we were talking about before. So the University of Auckland is placed seventh uh, in the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings for the research contributions to the UN Sustainable Development Goal number 16. So peace, justice and strong institutions. Um, Anna, would you be able to tell me how uh, the Auckland Law School is contributing to this work and why you believe it's to be important? Absolutely. So there's a whole lot of different things going on in the law school um, around ideas of peace and justice um, and building up institutions both domestically and internationally. So in terms of some of our academics um, who are actively involved in this kind of work, Associate Professor Trussa Dunworth um, has done a huge amount of work in the last decade around nuclear disarmament issues and has been actively involved at the United Nations advising on um, nuclear weapons treaties and helping to negotiate them. Professor Jane Kelsey has done a lot of work um, on trade initiatives and working with a number of different developing countries countries around the world to provide them with support when they're going into trade negotiations. And just one more example, there are many I could give, but um, Associate Professor Claire Charters um, is one of the world's leading experts on Indigenous rights. And she's done a huge amount of work with the United Nations um, and also with the New Zealand government around how do we provide better protection um, for Indigenous peoples throughout the world. So that's sort of the academic, gives you a bit of a taste at the academic level. With our student level, we've all also got a lot of different student programs where our students can get in involved and engaged with initiatives to further um, peace and justice ideas. One of the biggest student um, clubs that we have is our Equal Justice Project, um, which is a student initiative where students are involved in going into different legal organisations, community organisations, providing pro bono free legal advice. Um, they're also very actively involved in advocacy issues around um, climate change and refugee issues. So there's lots and lots going on. And I think um, it's wonderful that that's been recognised um, by the Times Higher Education um, rankings because um, it, it really there's lots of innovation and interesting things happening. Great, yeah. Um, so sticking with the sustainable development goals, uh, but moving over to uh, John now and, and for more of a uh, education uh, and social work um, uh, aspect. So the University of Auckland is United Nations um, academic impact hub for sustainability goal number four uh, relating to quality education. John, would you be able to tell me um, what is the Faculty of Education and Social Work doing that is notable in this space and how can it make an impact here uh, both domestically and um, overseas? Well, thanks. So then I think one of the first things to say is that sort of um, there's no room for complacency that sort of being number one, if you like, um, on a particular goal doesn't mean you just sit back and relax. Uh, there is plenty to do. So one of the things I, I would say is I think there are the way I conceptualize what happens in our faculty, education and social work is in four areas, all of which I think I, I want to put the word transforming around. So the notion of transforming prosperity and the definitions of what it means to give a good life. As I intimated earlier, there's a sense in which living a good life is not just only about 
gain in high incomes and secure jobs and so on if they're there it's about well-being and health so we have people working with broad notions of health and well-being within our faculty it's one of our sort of our, our areas linked with that is a notion of transforming people that what it means to live in our world is in, and to grow up and to be educated is is changing and there's a sort of attention to um the, the notions of diversity of living in an inclusive society we have the sort of black lives matter which is a global movement which is impinged on new zealand too we have um indigenous rights and so on are all about uh, the types of lives that people live as people um, but my third, the third area I would identify would be transforming, uh, transforming knowledges, um, the notion that particular forms of knowledge, we have multiple knowledges, we have local knowledges, we have different ways of representing the world, all of those are part of what happens in our faculty and people are working on questions of curriculum and place based knowledge. Um, to, to begin to sort of widen our definitions of knowledge. And finally, and last but not least, would be sustaining, uh, transforming sustainability and transforming environments, um, where increasingly we're recognizing that the social and the natural worlds cannot be separated. And we need to build those into all of our areas uh, of work. And I think that sort of identifies one of the sort of the, the sense that there, are, there is room to, to do more. For instance, one of the, the programs I'm very involved in is within teacher education. And at the moment, we don't have a curriculum development focus on all of our, for all of our beginning teachers around questions of environment. And we need to find ways to begin to, to make that central to all our conversations. Um, young people growing up in, in schools now, leaving school this year, next year, five years time, will be growing up in a very, very different world in terms of the climate change and the ecological challenges which they face. How does a curriculum and how can teachers prepare young people for that challenge? Yeah, you mentioned there that you've got uh, an interest, obviously, within um, teacher education, but you also, um, a lot of your, your research is, is rooted in geographical um, education. Would you be able to tell us more about the work in that area, John, uh, and the role education and, and perhaps educational leadership um, plays in sustainability and the importance of geographical uh, education in today's increasingly interconnected uh, world? Well, I suppose as a, as a geography educator, I would say that geography is the most important subject for identifying <laughs> sustainability. But uh, but I would say that. Um, but but I think there's this this sense of always trying to take a, a sort of a backward step and begin to look at where we've come. I, th I think it's really important that the modern environmentalism really is probably only 60 years old. Uh, the publication of Rachel Carson's famous book *Silent Spring*, um, and since then there's been a gradual recognition of the importance of sustainability um, in virtually all levels of society. So when I started teaching in 1988, large corporations in the UK, such as Marks and Spencer's, denied that climate change was happening. We are a long way from that now. In that period of 40 years, we recognised societally and in governmental terms that something needs to be done. We may not be doing it at that point, but it, as fast as we need to, but it's recognised and so on. And education is, is, is linked to that too, a need for, for the for, for centrality of debates about the environment within all curriculum subjects. My, my own sense as a, as a geographer is that we, we have struggled to incorporate environmental themes as explicitly in curricula across the world as we should do. Um, and so the people talk often that there's a geographical ignorance amongst particular generation, younger generations. And geography education is, is clearly concerned about that. But geography ought to be sort of seen as, as, as sort of a hub whereby all subjects within the curriculum have something to say. So environmental history, quite important for history to begin to talk about the big issues around the changing nature of earth systems. In terms of studying poetry and studying literature, the English curriculum can be a place to reflect on nature and the genres of nature writing. Um, science and sustainability obviously go hand in hand and the move towards more public understanding of science. So I, I sort of wouldn't want to be sort of um, territorial about the notion of geography as part of the curriculum. There needs to be a sort of outward radiating of environmental thinking and sustainable thinking at all levels of our curriculum. Thanks, John, and thanks, Anna, for your, your answers before that as well. Now, kind of um, staying on that same, uh, somewhat same theme of, of geography, uh, Tim, um, your research focuses on public policy, but also, you know, within international development and immigration law, which obviously relates to human geography uh, and comparative politics. Um, can you tell us about the Public Poli Policy Institute um, and what the work uh, that you're doing um, 
there is um, and how the research is helping make a difference in communities both uh, in here in New Zealand and um, offshore. Uh, sure, thanks Ben. Um, so the Public Policy Institute or PPI as it's uh, referred to here exists to foster independent critical research uh, on key policy issues that um, affects New Zealand but uh, broader the communities throughout the Asia Pacific and even around the world. Um, we uh, uh, sort of uh, develop the center on an interdisciplinary model um, and it brings scholars together from across the eight faculties um, of the university. Um, and the aim is to disseminate evidence-informed policy relevant knowledge. Um, we work with government on all levels here in New Zealand, including very close ties uh, with New Zealand's largest city here in Auckland, but also strong connections with central government ministries NGOs and communities in particular. And some of my work over the last um, year and a half has been to, to sort of broaden these partnerships out uh, to other parts of the world. And as Ben mentioned earlier, um, one of those initiatives is uh, currently underway uh, with the U21 partner at McMaster University in Ontario. We're doing an innovative um, public policy uh, training exercise that will be done in semester one next year where we're bringing students together and basically a um, from both universities to work on indigenous policy issues related to food security both in New Zealand and with First Nations uh, in Ontario and the opportunity for students here is to look at a policy problem in a comparative uh, context to explore issues here learn about how we engage with communities here to uh, solve policy problems, but also how do we and other researchers in other contexts identify problems and collaborate to find problems? So how can we lesson draw and work together on that? Um, the Public Policy Institute is sort of, sort of related to that is home of the Master of Public Policy program, which offers students the opportunities to gain practical skills um, in policy analysis, economics of policy, research skills, the opportunity to design their own research um, thesis or dissertation, um, and that lead to careers, and as I know we'll hear from one of our alums in a few moments, um, in the public policy and administration space, but also uh, if you wish to pursue further studies for a PhD. So we sort of uh, intersect there. And briefly, I'd just like to mention uh, the PPI is also um, an organization that's active at that intersection of research, um, and applied work with university. So we're currently hosting a, a large um, a Ministry of Business Innovation and Employment grant under the leadership of our, the center's director, Professor Jennifer Curtin, um, that's looking at gender budgeting practices within central government here in New Zealand. Um, we also host a trade school once a year with, to, in conjunction with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and trade uh, that brings together policy actors uh, from across uh, not only New Zealand but in the region that are interested in trade uh, policy issues. Um, so you get to mix it up a bit with uh, government officials and um, uh, other scholars from across the university and that's I think how I put it that we're sort of engaged to positively impact communities uh, uh, here and abroad. Fantastic. Thanks, Tim. I think um, you're quite right. I guess the, now more than ever, the, the need to be able to provide uh, students with, with that practical experience and show how to put it all into practice is, is now more important um, than ever. So it's fantastic that the Faculty of Arts and the University of Auckland does have that connection with the uh, Public, uh, Public Policy Institute, PPI. Um, sticking with you, uh, Tim, um, considering the current global, global landscape, how does the teaching, training, and research in public policy contribute to the thought leadership needed for a better society? Uh, right. Um, so this is sort of echoing a bit of um, something Anna mentioned earlier, but um, I mean, I think we, we're all uh, consumers of the news here, certainly, um, and I know all the um, participants in this are in their own countries, but we can look around the world and see these trends. This current landscape is at a crossroads of sorts. Um, and that redefining what's going to come forward to sort of echo John's earlier comments is 
this point, uh, the, the sort of inflection point, I suppose, for lack of a better term, that we're at in this current global landscape. Thinking about um, how, what the role, the proper role of government institutions is, and that these institutions are under assault. There's a lack of trust in many countries in these institutions. Some of it is well-earned lack of trust uh, due to corruption and other um, other things that, that sort of depress that citizen and non-citizen confidence in government organizations. Um, unmoored in some ways from the confidence in, uh, in these institutions, the academy is playing this crucial role um, here to think about training, teaching, research, and particularly in the public policy space. So I'm a fan of uh, geography as well. And then there's a lot of overlap between geography law and public policy. And public policy is best when it's informed by those other disciplines. And um, clearly, um, the University of Auckland, um, as um, you know, an, an institution of higher learning, um, leverages this world leading research and this research based teaching and training um, model to this purpose. The Masters of Public Policy courses, for example, are taught by policy researchers, many of whom were either practitioners at one time or who have engaged in fellowships uh, to go and work with government ministries to bring those lessons back from the bureaucracies uh, around the world back into the classroom and inform our research and teaching. Um, my approach, of course, is one that you should learn real world policy analysis techniques and engage in exercises in the classroom. I described one just a few moments ago that we're in the process right now of co-designing with our colleagues at McMaster University in Ontario that's designed to do just this. Um, but it's an opportunity uh, for students through this teaching and training to explore fresh ideas, pose challenging questions and to expand your thinking. And you never know, you might just generate an insight in the classroom that you're able to bring back uh, with you to your ministry or your NGO or wherever you're working in the world that makes a positive um, contribution to social change in your community. Thanks, Tim. Um, now, sticking within the, the uh, Master of Public Policy, we also have a special guest with us uh, today. Um, we have alumnus Min Chong on the panel with us, and we'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Um, you came here to New, uh, you came to New Zealand uh, as a New Zealand scholar, um, an ASEAN scholarship recipient, and you're now working uh, at the Consulate General uh, of Canada in Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon, Vietnam. Uh, can you tell us about how your time at the University of Auckland impacted your career and the vision that you had for the future? Thank you, Baron, for having me today. Well, I studied at the University of Auckland for the Master of Public Policy program back in 2016. And I think it has brought a valuable experience for my professional and personal development. I enjoy learning the critical knowledge and skills in comparative public policy, political management in government, trade and international relations. So I think believe that uh, this costly had uh, prepared me for drafting uh, policy briefing and making critical advice to high-level management, which are very useful for my role as a trade commissioner at the Consulate General of Canada. So uh, back in 2017, I had the opportunity to be the liaison for the Canadian Minister of International Trade at, uh, <coughs> sorry, at uh, APEC Summit in Vietnam. So as I mentioned earlier, the skill and knowledge that again from the MPP program was crucial for me to fulfill this uh, super challenging role, even though that it was uh, more, than, uh, more than a week. So uh, at the completion of the summit, I was among the local team that uh, supported Canadian leaders uh, to meet and shake hand with the Prime Minister of Canada, um, Justin Trudeau. So it was one of the most uh, memorable uh, milestones of my career. So uh, personally, I think the time studying at the University of Auckland has uh, contributed to the growth of my career and shaped my vision as a global citizen. I can work at my home country while making positive changes across borders. For example, enhancing trade flow between Canada and Vietnam. So this is something that I really value as an alumnus of the university and also as a former recipient of the New Zealand Scholar Awards. 
Fantastic. Thanks, Min. And sticking on that theme of uh, employability, so the University of Auckland ranks uh, 59th in the world for producing highly employable uh, graduates according to the 2020 QS Graduate Employability Rankings. Um, from an alumni perspective, what skills did you gain? And, and you've touched on this already a little bit, but um, how does this align uh, with shaping the future and creating a positive social impact? Yeah, uh, happy to share uh, my experience. So beyond studies in the classroom, I had the chance to do an internship at the office of a member of parliament in the Auckland area. So this is thanks to the great connection between the master public policy program and the public sector in New Zealand. Uh, for me, it was an eye-opening experience because I have a chance to engage uh, with the MP and talk about New Zealand politics election in New Zealand. And I also have the chance to observe how the MP interact and assist their constituents. An opportunity like that is rare in my home country because connection to politicians here for a student to do a research and internship is uh, somewhat limited. So in New Zealand, I also did some interview with other MPs for my research topic and all of them were very supportive. Uh, about creating social impact after uh, completion of my study, uh, I had been working with some alumni here in Vietnam and some in Asian countries to create a network to empower young people in our home country to pursue graduate study in New Zealand. Uh, we created Facebook for networking events, share our advice and experience. And we believe that this new generation can create further positive social impact if they can study overseas and bring those skills and knowledge to contribute to the social economic development of their country. Uh, so I just want to share a quote from Michelle Obama that I really like on helping others. Uh, when you work hard and done well and walk through the doorway to opportunity, you do not slam it shut behind you. You reach back and you give other folks the same chance that have you succeed. That's it the saying that, that I really, really uh, think that is uh, meaningful to me and also for um, uh, younger generation in Vietnam that want to pursue study uh, overseas. Fantastic. Thanks, Min. It sounds like you were an ideal candidate for uh, both the, the Master of Public Policy uh, at the University of Auckland, but also the New Zealand ASEAN um, scholarship, which is um, uh, which is centered around exactly what you have done. Come to New Zealand and, and really um, get the skills, get the training, get the education that you need in order to, to go home and then better yourself and, and better your communities. And, and it sounds like you're doing just that and, and not just stopping there, but also helping others, um, others go through that uh, process as well. So thank you so much um, for your insights there. Now, bringing it back around um, to something that we mentioned at the beginning and uh, also to bring our academics back into this conversation, it'd be good to hear from each of you uh, on this, uh, this last question. So uh, we have touched upon this um, in the past 45 minutes, but according to the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit, New Zealand ranks above all English speaking countries in educating students for the future. Um, why do you think New Zealand uh, does this so well? And how does this intersect with today's topic of creating a more sustainable and equitable future? Uh, perhaps if I could um, start with Anna. Sure, thanks so much, Ben. So, I think that New Zealand has a really long history of engaging um, with the international system and punching above its weight. Um, we were there at the founding of the United Nations and we've taken a really active interest um, both before and since that time in engaging with what's happening on the international stage. And because we're a relatively small country and we don't have heaps and heaps and heaps of people, there are a lot of different opportunities for people to get involved with a lot of the um, activities and initiatives that are happening around the big um, global challenges and around sustainability issues. So I think um, one of the reasons why New Zealand comes out well is because as a country, we've got a commitment to these ideas. There's a lot of discussion about them. There's a lot of engagement with them and there are heaps of opportunities. And I think we see that coming through into the university where many of the uh, staff and students are actively engaged um, and it's um, yeah, a really vibrant place to be in, in this sort of space. Thanks, Anna. Um, John? Mm. So I, you know, I was listening to, to what Anna just was saying there, I was, and I was sort of agreeing with it, but um, it was making me think that this morning I was reading 
um, around the history of British migration to New Zealand in the post-war period uh, from the United Kingdom and how New Zealand at that point was determined to have only British migrants at that point. This was 1947 and that was the official policy. Um, and how that is no longer the case and hasn't been since around the mid 1990s when New Zealand has opened the doors to a very various and multitudinous streams of migration flows, particularly from other parts of the Pacific region and South Asia, Southeast Asia, for instance. And the way in which that sort of that new source of migrants brings with it new ideas, new confluences, new opportunities to reinvent and be open. So there's a historical sort of relationship of New Zealand being a small country at the edge of the world off the map, on the edge of the map, which has to reach out to other parts of the world and therefore makes it more receptive to ideas and to different cultural influences and so on. So I think there's something is sort of I'm thinking aloud here, but I think it would be really interesting to explore. That's what makes New Zealand feel different. I've been here from the United Kingdom 10 years ago, 10 years, and you probably the same, Ben. Um, to be in the UK is living in an old country. To, to be in New Zealand feels like you're living in a new country. And I think that's got something to do with the future orientated nature of New Zealand's um, education system. Yeah, I would, uh, I would agree with you there. And it's only been three and a half years for me, but, um, <laughs> but I can definitely, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still a newbie. Um, uh, Tim, would you also be able to add some uh, insights there? Yeah, thanks. Um, those are all really good points. So I just want to uh, do two things. Uh, add a couple of comments briefly and then contextualize this a little bit to my role here at the university, the Public Policy Institute, working with graduate students. So uh, out of these rankings, uh, New Zealand ranks particularly high for gender equality, diversity, and tolerance. Okay? The university has an explicit focus on student support, including English language enrichment, research support resources, and career development pathways. So students emerge from the programs ready to begin or resume their careers or to pursue further uh, education opportunities as far as your interest should take you. What this suggests to me is a stimulating, nurturing environment for international students that allows you to build a range of analytical skills while not losing your individual identities or feeling like you have to mute the richness of your culture during your studies here. You have the opportunity to flourish in a place that's beautiful, welcoming, and supportive. That's what brought me here. I was a student here. So like, it's like the, in the United States, we have the funny commercial, the hair club for men. And the guy would talk and he has a beautiful head of hair. And then at the end, he says, I'm not only uh, the president of the hair club, I'm a member. And he shows a picture and he's, he was bald before. Okay. So that's kind of this experience. I speak, I was a student here and uh, now I work here and live here and have been here for 10 years, just like John. So um, in sum, learning happens both inside and out of the classroom. In my view, the ranking is an important indicator for a student thinking about a place to go that allows you to reach your potential make lasting relationships, is a theme I mentioned earlier, and, and to have an education that's fit for purpose, to make a positive social impact in your community. Great, thank you so much, Tim, there. And that actually concludes the, the set questions that we did have um, for the panel um, uh, this afternoon. Uh, we do have questions from the audience. I believe one has come through, and this would be, uh, this would be sticking with you, uh, Tim. Um, would you be able to speak to the career or employability uh, statistics of students in the education or public policy, um, to take public policy programs, especially if they're international? Is there anything that you'd be able to, to touch upon uh, there? I know we've got Min here who is also um, is a, is a graduate of those programs, obviously doing very, very well within his career as well. But is there anything else you would be able to touch on there? Yeah, I, I did notice that question come up and I was quickly trying to see if I could grab some some stats here in the background and I don't have anything on at my fingertips. I don't know if um, no problem. If, if John has some from education, but uh, I can resolve. Um, you can get in touch with me um, it, with that question offline and I will try to track down some numbers for you to try to help, help you to um, understand that a little bit more. No problem. John, is that the same for you? I mean, because we can always uh, go back and get some um, 
accurate statistics for that. Um, for I that can attendee, certainly put, but... put, give you some names of people who have that data in their in their minds and in their fantastic hands. so what we'll do with that question is um we will get that answered for you um but uh yeah we'll uh we'll just make sure that we we get the statistics on that okay so um if you want to find out any more uh if anything that we talked about was um of a, a big importance uh and interest of you uh then you can follow us on facebook all the social medias are there so there is facebook twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, and there is also, if you want to find out a little bit more about what the University of Auckland is doing uh, more within that sustainability space, uh, there is a QR code at the bottom uh, right hand of your screen there. So um, just in case um, people aren't aware of how to, how to operate that, if you have your smartphone, you open the camera, if you hold that up to that um, little box there, you should be taken to the uh, link for the um, sustainability webpage on the University of Auckland website. Very similarly, um, we do have these postgraduate uh, study options that we've kind of talked around today. So we have the Master of Laws and Master of Legal Studies by the Faculty of Law, Master of Educational Leadership at the Faculty of Education and Social Work, and the Master of Public Policy at the Faculty of Arts. Again, uh, feel free to um, scan those, um, those QR codes if you want some further information uh, there. Now moving on to the next slide, um, we've talked um, today about the uh, the Public Policy Institute and Tim's work with uh, within that. Um, but this, it doesn't just stop there at the University of Auckland. We have over 27 research units, centres um, and institutes uh, that we work alongside um, and within at the University of Auckland. And again, if you scan those um, QR codes and again, all these PowerPoints will be sent through sent through to you uh, after the event, uh, you can find out about uh, what other um, research centers and institutes that we're also, uh, also working with there. Now, last but not least, um, we do have our um, virtual campus. Um, so this is a, a new thing, your world, your way. This is wherever you're tuning in from, whether it's within New Zealand or whether it's um, outside of New Zealand, um, you can explore our campus in a virtual uh, way and do that remotely. Um, so you can visit the yourworld.auckland.ac.nz uh, website uh, in order to look at the uh, facilities, the campus amenities, uh, the services that we do offer at the University of Auckland. And you can also cater to, to what you're interested in. So it may be that you're really interested to see what the uh, sports facilities are like at the University of Auckland. And you can do that and make sure that your experience and your campus tour is tailored um, to, what you're, to what you're interested in. Um, so I definitely recommend uh, having a look uh, at that as well. And that concludes uh, the first session of the international webinar series of Shaping the Future. I um, just want to say a huge, huge thank you to our panelists today um, and uh, all the academics and also um, Min Trong from, um, from Vietnam today. And a huge thank you uh, also to uh, the two international managers working behind the scenes at the moment, Chandra and Anna from the Faculty of Arts and the Faculty of Law. Um, they've done a lot of the heavy lifting uh, to get this webinar um, uh, going today. So a uh, huge thank you to them. And then a special, special thank you to everybody attending today. Really, really appreciate you making the time um, to listen uh, about what we have to say about shaping the future through education, public policy and law. And be sure to register um, for the other events. It's the same time next week. So next week we have Shaping the Future through Medical and Health Sciences and the Faculty of Science. And then the week after, on the 29th of October, we'll have um, Shaping the Future through Business Innovation and uh, Creative Arts and Industries, focusing on design and then engineering as well. So we look forward to seeing you there. And um, we really look forward to seeing you at the University of Auckland campus uh, in the, uh, in the uh, not too distant future. Kakite, and thank you so much for attending. Okay, bye-bye.